Greetings and welcome to this edition of Positronic. Positronic. I'm Barry P. Cook. Let's talk about the latest episode of Star Trek Lower Decks. It was called Weed Judge. Assuming I'm pronouncing that correctly, it's Klingon for three ships, apparently. We start off where we see that the crew gets a little R&R because they're on a long-haul warp. Boimler learns that the other ensigns are hanging out with different commanders for their R&R and muses that he might not be left in the lurch the way apparently he is if he were on a Klingon ship where there is likely a more robust social structure. Of course, we then cut to a Klingon ship, a bird of prey, which has a complement of about a dozen officers and men. Where the Klingons are Klingoning, of course, and we see that the lower decks on the bird of prey are not dissimilar from the Starfleet version, the ensigns on the Cerritos, as well as that they bleed reddish pink, in the words of the captain, who also says at one point, Cry havoc and let's slip the dogs of war. We also see a Vulcan ship where the Vulcans are Vulcaning, of course, and it turns out that their lower decks are also not dissimilar from the Starfleet ensigns, to the extent that one of the female ensigns is also a person who apparently routinely books protocol and expectations like Mariner does, but in very, very modest ways by comparison. Though she does say that logic is the beginning of wisdom, not the end. Back on the Cerritos, we see that Boimler is trying to find a commander to hang out with for his R&R, &R, and that he almost gets trashed by the uh, security chief, Stax, is that his name? Yeah. When Boimler suggests that the chief might have had some leisure time back on Bayshore, he says something like, oh, is, did you learn how to do this in your leisure time on Bayshore? Which really angers Stax because apparently he only had time for resistance activities. He didn't do anything but resistance. So he gets kind of mad. So Boimler hightails it out of there and he then, joins the cat doctor lady, whose name I can never remember, and Tandy, uh, Tendi rather, in a simulation that has Tendi and the doctor free climbing Mount Capitan, or El Capitan. Like in Star Trek V, which Formler goes in for a closer look of by flying up to them on rocket boots while wearing a sweatshirt that says, go climb a rock, just before one of his boots uh, fails him, and he falls, landing on a tree branch some distance below. And I just thought that was awesome, because it's a callback, obviously, to Star Trek V and the whole climbing Mount El Capitan or Mount Capitan, and you know the whole jet boots thing and the go climb a rock. I mean, it's just it was just awesome. The next thing we see Boimler doing is he peeks in on a holodeck simulation between Mariner and her mother. We're basically just arguing and firing phases at each other, which I guess is how they do R and R. I don't know, but he takes off from that really quick as well. As we see that the captain is wearing a shirt that says Ritos. Just like they have the shirt that says Disco. Anyway, back on the Klingon ship, we see that the Klingon captain seems to have allied himself with the pack leads. This, of course, is much to the dismay of one of the Klingon ensigns who seems to have a strong sense of duty like Boimler. When the Cerritos detects Metreon particles that resulted from the use by the pack leads of a bomb that the Klingons had given them, they discover the Klingons and the pack leads together, but at first didn't realize that the Klingons were working with them. Back to Boimler, we see that he ends up having to confess during an emergency when the pack leads attack the ship and he's afraid he will die as a liar, that he isn't from Hawaii, as he had recently been pretending to be in order to get in with the first officer and two other officers who, unbeknownst to him and each other, were also pretending to have been from Hawaii for the same reason they wanted to fit in with somebody else on the ship. It's kind of silly, but there you go. While all this is going on, we also get a look at the lower decks on the pack led uh, ship and there wasn't a lot to see there. The Vulcan ship arrives at the scene of this battle which is now going on between the pack leads and the Cerritos. Having also detected the situation from a distance 
and it gets between the Packlet ship and the Cerritos before implementing an experimental shield extending technology in order to increase the shields, after which they attack the Packlet ship, which flees the scene shortly after the Klingon ship does likewise, when the ensign on the bird of prey overthrows the captain, who he deemed to be acting dishonorably. And at that moment, we hear music from, I think, Star Trek II, so it was very cool. I don't want to gloss over this too much. This scene all happened because the Vulcan ensign first implemented some scans that she really wasn't supposed to do because they were sort of beyond the parameters of what her duties were. This is how they detected the situation from a distance. And then they ended up using her new shield design thing in order to make the shields better. And it was only because, again, she bucked protocol and designed something that wasn't really, you know, part of her duty assignment, which is funny because it's, that's the Vulcan version of Mariner going off book, which of course, when Mariner does it is much, much more consequential. Anyway, it was just very cool. It's, you know, the writers seem to really know Star Trek and they really get Star Trek, and they convey ideas to us who also really get Star Trek without having to spell out what they're doing. We see it as it's, as it's unfolding, and we get it without having to be told what's happening. And that's because the writers really understand Star Trek, which is confusing to me because in the beginning, they seemed not to understand that Starfleet is an organization with a hierarchy and protocols, and that Starfleet officers behave a certain way because they just threw that out the window in the beginning, which is why I really couldn't stand this show. Also because it was kind of too rapid fire. But over the course of the first season, towards the end, I started to see where, okay, maybe they kind of get it. And this season, it really shows that they, they really do get it and they really do love Star Trek. They don't depict Starfleet and the officers in a way that, well, they don't portray it. They don't portray Starfleet as a joke anymore. They don't portray the Starfleet officers as a joke anymore the way they used to. So it's just uh, a fun show to watch. There are moments where I go, oh, I'm not sure I like that. I'm not comfortable with that, you know, in the setting of Star Trek. But overall, it's just, it's just a really good show. And, and that's what was happening during this episode with depicting the ensigns on the other ships so that we would recognize that they were parodying Boimler and parodying Mariner without them having to come out and say it. And, and that is what Star Trek should be. It has always been best when it examines the human condition. In this case, it was doing that via alien races, but th the idea was they were showing us that even on the alien ships, there are people just like the people on the Cerritos and that certain behavior sets are universal, even if they're carried out a little differently. The Klingon guy isn't as <laughs> as Boimler, but he has the same sense of duty and the same sense of doing the right thing. And the Vulcan ensign isn't as flippant or crazy as Mariner by any stretch of the imagination. But in spirit, she has the same attitude which is that you do what needs to be done and if it goes against protocol it's not you know it, it's not the end of the world so and, and and some of that mirrors spock as well in later life which is very cool but anyway the vulcan ensign speaking of her is actually punished for her <laughs> outside the box ways despite the fact that it was because of her tendencies that the vulcans were able to discover that the cerritos needed help and her punishment is being reassigned to a Federation ship where her captain feels that she will be better off since she seems to have what he sees as emotional tendencies. So my first thought was, oh wow, I wonder if they're gonna put her on the Cerritos. Somehow I doubt that. I don't think they'd add another character. At this point, they might. Uh, either way, it'll, it'll, be, uh, it, it'll be cool to see that actually, but uh, I'm not sure they'll do that. Formula winds up being approached by what seemed to be a cadet that was serving on a ship, I guess graduated from the academy, but not yet an ensign, which is a thing they, I guess they do sometimes. They, they started really doing it on Discovery. Maybe Next Gen with Wesley, I don't remember. Anyway, seems this guy is having trouble organizing his duty schedule. 
And he went to Boimler about it because the first officer had told him that Boimler was the most efficient guy around and that he would likely be of great help to the ensign. And he ends up being told by the cadet that the cadet really admires his work, which was really cool because you don't get to see Boimler with too many hero moments. And this was sort of one of those. So I thought it was cool. And it was contrast to the Vulcan situation. The episode ends with a peek at the lower decks on a board cube. And we see that they just stand there in their alcoves, silent and completely motionless, <laughs> which was pretty cool. So I thought this was a really, really good episode. Like I said, it shows that the writers do in fact get Star Trek. And I find myself wishing that the people who were doing this show were doing Picard and Discovery because they do not seem to get Star Trek. They do on Picard more so than on Discovery, but wow, could they use some of these guys, I think, to write those shows. It, it would make them so much better. Anyway, the next episode in this season is going to be the season finale, so I'm looking forward to it, and I will, of course, be back with a review of that episode. Until then, I wish you all peace and long life.